guys and ladies are tough, and I'm proud of you because uh, some of the stuff we're going to talk about is not easy things, but it's things we need to know. Sin is a lot like wasted calories, okay? And, and, and I know a lot about that because I eat and have ate a lot of wasted calories. They serve no, no good. But I tell you what, I love my mom's candy cane cookies so much. I love cherries and my mother-in-law. I love her poppy seed bread, and man, it was good. She also makes these little cookies, and I ate way too much of everything. But sin is the same way. Sin can taste so sweet in that moment, yet it does us no good at all. It does no, no good whatsoever. And it's a shame because what does the holiday say on TV when you watch commercials? Eat more, spend more, do all these things, right? That's what the world tells us to do. But um, we know, those of us that know, know that you shouldn't partake in some of that stuff. But it's the holidays, you'll get over it. So what's going to happen next? Has anybody been to Walmart lately? If you've been to Walmart, not only does uh, the Christmas stuff go 50% off, now they're busting out the shake weights, right? You ever seen those? Those are the craziest things ever. Anybody see a shake weight? You don't know, Google it. It's, I don't understand anybody use that. But anyways, whatever. But, you know, you're going to see the shake weights. You're going to see all this weight loss stuff. You're going to see slim fast and everything brought forward. Because why? When you eat and you do these things you know you shouldn't do, you got to do something to get it off, right? I know me, I'm going to start running, you know, tomorrow I'm giving myself one more day, and then I'm going to start running and doing all the things that I should have been doing during the holidays. Sin can be a lot the same way. Sin is a lot like that. We live in a world that just is inundated with gray area. We live in a world that says, eh, it doesn't matter what the Bible says. Let's live what feels good. Let's do what, what's right by the world's eyes. We tend to always go to social media and compare ourselves to others. We look to others that, hmm, I don't think my sin's as bad as Johnny's over here. Well, Abigail's over here. It's not near as bad. You know, uh, uh, little Freddie over here. It's, it's, you know, whatever. We tend to like to compare ourselves with others. And it's sad because we shouldn't do those things. And there's one person that we need to compare ourselves with when it comes to sin, and, and that's Jesus. Don't compare your sin to me. Don't compare your sin to anybody else. Compare it to Jesus and Jesus alone. 2016, Lifeway Research polled Americans about their basic theological knowledge. All right, 74% stated, smaller sin doesn't warrant eternal damnation. Hmm. Think about that. Does, does the Bible not say that all have fallen short of the glory of God? And we all do. There's no big sins or little sins, right? Yet 74% of the world says smaller sin doesn't warrant that. 75% stated they don't take their faith that seriously. Huh, what if? We live in a world that we're more worried about what we watch on Netflix, what we watch on social media. That's what we're worried about. We are worried about the things of the world, and we've gotten away from what God has to say for each and every one of us. We, we don't care anymore. Everything's a gray area. Everything is just whatever. We go to church and we worry about our meatloaf. We go to church and we worry about our pot roast. We go to church and we worry, when's it going to be over? Is he going to land the plane sooner than later? See, we do all these things because we have developed as Christians, unfortunately, a worldly mindset. And, and I'm going to say this and be completely honest. You cannot expect heavenly blessings and live like hell. I'm going to say that one more time. You cannot expect heavenly blessings and live like hell. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. We need to live the way God has told us to live. Now, again, we, we and I study other pastors, and I love them, and I love other churches and what they do and where they go and, and some of the amazing things that they do. Sin's not talked about a whole lot. Let's be honest. It's not. We don't like to hear it makes us uncomfortable, does it not? It, it makes us wonder about, am I doing that wrong? Well, I always thought it was right, but is it wrong? world that just wants to sugarcoat everything. We, we live in a world that just, mm. we live in a world that is not a godly world. Would we all agree to that? 
We live in a world that no longer states Jesus is Lord. Christy and I was on our way to church this morning, and we drove by the Branson Cross, and it was kind of it was really cool. The fog was all underneath it, and it was just the cross sticking up. And, you know, that cross symbolizes that Jesus is Lord. He always has been, and he always will be, and I love it. And many of your churches today don't even have a cross in them. We have a cross here because we believe in what the cross signifies. We believe in the symbolism of what the cross has. You see, if it wasn't for Christ's shed blood and, and his amazing resurrection, we would have no hope. We would have nothing to look forward to. You see, we've won the lottery, and we won the lottery every day. We don't even realize it. We take it for granted. Because we live in a world that says you can do what you want and live how you want and you'll still go to heaven. I'm going to be honest with you, completely honest today. There is only one way to heaven and that is through Jesus Christ. Amen. John 14, 6, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we know this. And we get this thing called grace and we get this thing called mercy. And it's almost, we use it like a license to sin, if you will. Some people think, oh, I'm covered by the blood. You ever, you ever, we sing songs about that, right? <laughs> covered by the blood of Jesus, and I love that. I want to tell you something, church. If you live the life where you think you can do whatever you want and still end up in heaven and not feel bad, you're living a life that is not worth living. What do you mean by that, pastor? Here's what I mean. Many pastors right now in today's world are preaching sermons on Vision Sunday, Right? 2020 Vision Sunday. That's what a lot of pastors are preaching today. Their vision for the church. A lot of past pastors are preaching blessings. You know, you want to be blessed in 2020. You want a different life in 2020. Well, I'm giving you the same message wrapped up in one word. You want that kind of message? You get rid of the sin. It's just that simple. You cannot, and I'm going to say it again, you cannot live like hell and expect a heavenly blessing. It does not work. It will not work. And God has so many blessings that he wants to pour down on you. But yet, if you're doing things you can't do, do you feel like you're going to be showered with blessings? Let me give you a visual example. If you've got little kids, and they're little hellions at times, they all are, let's be honest, and you take them to the store, right? And they're screaming and yelling, and are you going to buy them a toy? Heck no. You're going to take them back out to the car and tell them to be quiet. That Happy Meal they was promised ain't happening now, right? Maybe you do that just to shut them up. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But here's the deal. When, when we don't shower down blessings or shower down things for people that are rebelling, do we, typically? No. Why would you expect God to do the same thing if you were living a lifestyle that's not what God wants for you? You see how that works? We've got one standard as parents, and we've got another standard for ourselves as Christians. It makes no sense the way we believe sometimes. Let me give you one more thing. A recent Barna survey found that less than half the country can name the first five books of the Bible. Less than half the country can name the first five books of the Bible. Big biblical ignorance is not for the professing Christian. It's inexcusable. I'm going to say that again. It's inexcusable. Let me ask you this. If Christ stood before you right now and said, let me ask you a question. How come you haven't read your Bible? Let me ask you a question. How come you haven't prayed more lately? What excuse could you give Jesus for him to say, oh, I understand. Think about that. You can't. There is no excuse possible that we can come up with. I don't care how busy you are. You have no excuse for not reading, studying, and applying God's word into your life. You have no excuse whatsoever that you could give God to justify that answer. None whatsoever. But yet we go to church and we expect to learn about God and we don't do anything at home. Do you realize you are the church? You realize that? We just huddle here. We get the game plan and it starts when we hit the doors. That's what church is. That's what it is. But again, there's no excuse that would justify that. Today we're going to look at sin and we're going to look at it like wasted calories, like the calories that I wasted this last week, right? I could have been working out looking like the rock, right? That's my goal one day is to look like the rock. If I get to pick my body in heaven and just Xerox the rock and stick my head on there, right? That's what I want to look like. But I don't get that choice. That's up to God and I trust him with everything I got anyways. Today we're looking at sin. 
Now again, we look at sin. We look at God. Let me rewind. We look at religion. We look at relationship like an all-you-can-eat buffet. I talk about this quite often. Everybody here ate a buffet? Okay? You don't get a body like this and not eat buffet. Okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. Right? It's good. All right? Certain pizzas I love a lot and certain I just want to stay away from. No, thank you. We look at religion much the same way. Boy, I want that grace, and man, I want that mercy. Boy, come on now. God, bring it down. I want them blessings. Come on now. Mm -mm, I want all that. And yet God gives us these set of rules, and we stay away from them. You know, it's amazing. It all comes from the same book called the Bible, but yet we tend to overlook some of these things, and we wonder why we don't have the other. You ever think about that? Do you realize that one works together with the other? So I talked about watching a lot of movies and watching a lot of TV shows, and I did a lot of that this week, and, and I was amazed at the fact of the way the world has gotten in 2019. I grew up in a time, this is how old I am. They didn't say the D word on regular TV, all right? You had to watch cable to, see, to hear the D word, all right? You didn't get that on regular TV. They did not say that. Now, they say some words that I'm still like, did they really just say that? I'll, I'll actually stop it and be like, did they say what I thought they did? Christian's like, oh yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. We live in a world that no longer keeps God holy. We live in a world that says, if it feels good, do it. Go for it. So let's go back to my movies and TV shows. So I started watching these movies and I started watching these TV shows. And they all had a, a theme about them. That many of the things that they would talk about was no big deal. And I believe it's infiltrated us as Christians. I believe it's infiltrated the church. I believe many of us partake in them daily. And we don't even feel bad about them anymore. That's the reason for today's sermon. I want you to be blessed. I want you to have the best year ever in 2020. I want you to have everything God has for you. But it starts with you and it starts with me looking at ourselves and saying, God, what don't you like about me? God, what can I change? How much closer can I follow you? There's no greater feeling in the world than when you, are, you, feel, you feel like Christ is just right there, right? Like you're in the passenger seat and he's driving you down Highway 65, you know? You, you, we've all had that feeling, that closeness that we get. Yet when we sin and we live in this world that says, if it feels good, go for it, we tend to miss that feeling of closeness with the Lord. God never went anywhere. It's us that went somewhere. It's us that removed ourselves. I, I love what Cornelius Plantiga Jr. says about just how amazing sin is if we don't look at it this way. Let me, let me show you. The only way we can rightly understand what sin is depends on seeing it as a rejection of God and his authority. I don't think there's any one of us here that would knowingly thumb our nose up to God, would we? But do you realize you thumb your nose up to God every time you willingly sin? When you know what you're doing, you shouldn't do. You are willingly thumbing your nose up at him. Do you ever think about it that way? Let that sink in. The only way we can rightly understand what sin is depends on seeing it as a rejection of God and his authority. It's pretty hard words, isn't it? Let me give you my sermon in a sentence. Sin is like eating sweets. It can taste great for a minute, but serves no purpose other than temporary pleasure. Let me repeat that. Sin is like eating sweets. It can taste great for a minute, but serves no purpose other than temporary pleasure. Today, we're going to look at John. We went through Peter here a while back. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, James, John, and Peter were probably Jesus' best friends. Many times we read in the scriptures where they were the first to talk about things. Many times we read in the scriptures where they did things together. John knew Jesus, and he knew him very well. And I believe when he wrote this book, he wrote it in a way that holds nothing back. You're going to see that when we start reading it. He holds nothing back to us whatsoever. It's pointed, it's point blank, it's in your face, and honestly, today's sermon is much the same way. I want you to have the best year in 2020, and it starts with you and I removing the sin from our lives so God can pour down blessing on you and I. If you got your Bibles, and I pray you did, go to the very last book of Revelation. And then you're going to flip back three, four maybe, and you're going to be at 1 John. We're going to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. 
If you're cheating like me, I've got it up on the board. And we're reading out of the New Living Translation. As you're turning there, let me give you a few things. James and John were the sons of Zebedee. These were the men that wanted to call down fire from heaven. These were the men that were so on fire for the Lord, they was ready to smite them people and just have God smoke them right then and there. This man, John, is also referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved, meaning they were close. They were very close. So I believe as John talks to us today through his letter, I believe we see just how Jesus felt about sin. Now, we don't know who the authorship is directly because 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John does not designate an author, but we know from the writing style that it was more than likely John, okay? That's why it's called 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So if you're there, let's turn to chapter 2, starting with verse 1, and we're going to read 1 through 6, and the New Living Translation says this. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. Now wait a minute, what do you mean? We all know that we all sin, right? Every single one of us sin. Every single day we sin. What he's talking about, the kind of sin he's talking about, is unconfessed, unrepentant, continual sin. It's a lifestyle where you say, I know I shouldn't do this, but I do it anyway. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. Pause there. Think of a courtroom. Think of God being the judge. And think of Jesus being the lawyer pleading our case before him. Every time we sin, you know, God, buddy didn't mean to do that. Did you, did you hear what he said? He said he was sorry and he's going to do his best not to do it again. I, I believe he will. Did you hear what Carolyn said? She didn't mean to do that. She's going to do her best not to do it again. We can apply this to every single one of us. And then John identifies who this advocate is. It's Jesus, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. Not only our sins, but the sins of the world. And that's the great thing about Jesus. His death on the cross was not just for us in this church, but for anyone who believe on him. In verse 3, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. Whoa. Did you hear what he said? If you claim you know God and you don't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. Verse 5, but those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Now, in this right here, we see John tell us three things. He's challenging us to do three things. We need to love God, we need to know God, and we need to live in God. Okay? And we're going to break these down. We need to love God, we need to know God, and we need to live in God. Now, I think if I was to ask any Christian here today, they would say they love God, Right? I think we all would say we love God, and we do love God in our own humanly, earthly way, okay? But I believe, as we'll see today, that we can love Him in a way that will secure a relationship where you'll feel Him more often. You see, what, what, what happens to us is we all have emotions, right? Anybody here get happy? Anybody here get sad? Anybody here get mad? Anybody here? I mean, you know, we could go on through our emotions. It's our emotions that takes this feeling of closeness with God away. That's why we have to love God and live in God and know Him the way we should. So let's start with loving God. Let's start with loving God. Verse 1 and 2. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the world. The greatest thing about Christ's shed blood is it's powerful enough to forgive our past. It's powerful enough to forgive our present. And it's powerful enough to forgive our future. But I want to say this. I believe we live in a time where people have decided that, you know what? It's a license to sin. If his shed blood is so great, it doesn't matter what I do. As a matter of fact, there's a new movement in Springfield called CLF, and they believe in this. They believe in this hyper grace. 
This grace that says if you fall under grace and mercy with the Lord, if Christ is your Savior, it doesn't matter. You don't have to repent. Think about that. If your kid continually kicked you in the knee, what would you do? You'd get upset, right? We, we need to, as children of God, give God the respect as our Heavenly Father and love Him and treat Him the way He deserves. We don't, every time we sin, we're kicking him in the knee. Every time, and some of us just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. That's the kind of sin I'm focusing on today, the unrepentant, unconfessed, continual sin. Some of that is lifestyle. Some of that is things that we do. Some of that is activities. Some of it is just all kinds of things that we deal with over and over again. And we've gotten to a point in the world where it's accepted. It's accepted anywhere and everywhere. Matter of fact, the foundation from this sermon, again, was based on watching TV shows, from watching movies. I went and seen Star Wars. Any Star Wars fan here? Man, I'm not going to say anything about it, but it's good. All but the ending. I didn't care for the ending. There's like two minutes in the ending, that, or 30 seconds, five seconds. Watch it and let me know what you think and see if we'll compare notes. Other than that, it was awesome. We can't go anywhere where the world is not involved in our movies, in our TV shows, in anywhere. The world is in everything. It's in our music, and it's never changed, right? I'm a kid of the 80s, right? We had rap music that still curls my hair. Well, what hair I have left, right? I mean, it was, it was bad stuff, and I used to really like it. But the closer I've grown to the Lord, the more I know that's not the kind of music that I need to be listening to. When I love God, if I love God, I am going to turn from anything that does not bring Him glory. If I want to have this relationship where I want God to be the driver, Jesus to be the driver, and I'm in the passenger side, I'm going to do everything I can to make Him happy, to turn from our sin. Let me give you a quote. John Murray, he's a Scottish theologian, said this, The glory of the cross is bound up with the effectiveness of its accomplishment. Every day, we've won the lottery. I think many times, you know, we get caught up in this world and we think, man, if I just won the lottery, I would do this and I would do that. I'd live so much. Boy, I'd just, I'd build that new, I'd build the Way Community Church, a brand new church, right? After I built my big mansion, you know, come on now. We all, but we have all won the lottery. And I believe not until we get to heaven and we see the glorious graciousness, the magnificence that heaven is, will we truly be able to appreciate the cross like we should? I think we all appreciate it that are growing close to the Lord. But I believe when we see it, and not only that, when we see heaven, when we see what we're saved from, I believe it is, we are just going to be like, God, I'm sorry, I, I took it for granted. I'm talking to myself, too. We can profess this stuff, we can claim this stuff all day long, but until we get to heaven and we can look down and see how amazing it is, we'll truly not love God the way we should. Doesn't mean we don't try though, amen? It means we try our hardest. So next, what about knowing God? In verses 3 and 4, John tells it the way it is, and I love this. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey his commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. You cannot get any more pure, plain, and simple than that right there. That person is a liar and not living in the truth. Harsh words, right? If we are knowingly sinning, if we are knowingly doing what we ought not to be doing, we're thumbing our nose at the Lord. Think about that. Let that sink in. You know, we've got this thing called the Holy Spirit that lives in every single one of us as Christians. And it's kind of like our check engine light. I'm a car guy, okay? So forgive me for the illustration. You ever had your check engine light come on? All right. Are you like me? Do you try to ride your gas tank out to see how far you can get before you, you know, right by the pump? I've done that several times. Stupid. No reason to, right? No good for me to do that, but I do it. And I think we look at sin the same way. I'm going to keep pushing that line and see how far I can go. God gave us the Holy Spirit to warn us not to do certain things. You see, there's certain things in my life that I don't really think is a big deal, but Christy, it's a big deal to her. And there's things in my life that it's a big deal to me, but to her, it's not that big of a thing. Now, we're going to talk about marriage here in just a minute, but when two become one, that's what we do. We share in that. When two become one, what's important to her is important to me. And what's important to me is important to her. 
If we can knowingly sin and not feel guilty, we need to be concerned in our relationship with the Lord. If we, I'm going to repeat that. If we can knowingly sin and not feel guilty, we need to be concerned. If we love God the way we should, we're going to do our best. Let me say it this way. To know God is to follow his commandments. To know God is to follow his commandments. But you know, the world's gotten in the way of everything again. The world has gotten in the way of everything. So let me give you some worldly wisdom. The great theologian Yoda, you all know him, right? You didn't realize he did biblical stuff. Well, he did, really didn't. But he's got some good advice. He says this, do or do not, there is no try. Let me repeat that. Do or do not, there is no try. We as Christians are either doing what God tells us to do or we're not doing what God wants us to. Think about that. We're either doing what God wants us to or we're not. Next time you sin and you knowingly are doing something you ought not to be doing, I want you to think of it this way. You're thumbing your nose at God. Think about that. You are willingly saying, ah, whatever. One thing I love about the Lord is he, he illuminates Scripture to us as we read. And, and one thing I've read for many, many years, but it never really sunk in, was the temple. Our body is compared to a temple. We know that, right? And, and I'm going to get really real here for just a second, so forgive me for what I'm going to say. We know that the temple was the Holy of Holies where God resided, right? The presence of God was in the Holy of Holies. Do you realize the presence of God resides in us, right? It's the Holy Spirit. Can I ask you something? In, in, in 3 BC, would you take a fifth of vodka and bring it into the Holy of Holies? In 3 BCs, would, would, would you take and light up a joint in the Holy of Holies? No. When we do these things, and, and again, I'll get there in just a second. Don't hang me out to dry yet. But, but would we willingly and knowingly sin against God in that way? But yet we do every time we do any sin that's unconfessed, unrepentant, and continued. We are bringing something horrible and awful into the Holy of Holies before God. I think every single one of us would run from Jesus if he knew what we were doing at times, right? Would we like kind of hide down? It's not me, Lord. I'm, I'm not doing that, right? But do you realize if Christ lives in us, if the Holy Spirit lives in us, he sees what you're watching. He hears what you're hearing. He knows what you're doing. He's right there with you. Let that sink in next time you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. He's right there with you. He's all up in the middle of it. Think about that. If you're willingly and knowingly sent, now again, I want to be careful here. None of us are perfect. Amen? None of us are perfect. What I'm talking about is unconfessed, unrepentant, continual sin. So let me say this. I was talking to my daughter about sin and what we were talking about today, and she gave me this wonderful illustration, and I love it. Anybody here ever been to New York? All right, anybody here ever seen New York, right? Landscape of New York. Big buildings, tall buildings, short buildings, wide ones, all this, right? We look at New York in this way as these big things. We tend to look at our sin the same way, right? Well, it, Johnny does a really big sin. I only do a little sin, right? And then I compare myself over to here, and boy, she does a really, really bad sin, but I just got this itty-bitty sin. God says... When you widen the scope and you go from a side landscape to an overview, do you think God sees sizes when he's looking down from the top? No. He just sees buildings, right? Our sin is the same way. doesn't matter how big or small it is. From the top looking down, sin is sin. Not big, not small. Sin is sin. And we have a hard time with that as Christians, right? Anybody here ever have your list? Well, God, I know I'm sinning, but... I dropped two bucks in the offering plate as it went by. I said a 30-second prayer when I went to bed last night. I got up and I thanked you that I could walk. You know, we have this list that we think we're really doing good stuff. We can always do better. Amen? We can always grow closer. We can always stop sinning as much as we possibly can. Romans 6, 23 states, the wages of sin are death. This is everything, thoughts, words, and actions. It doesn't matter. Sin is sin, and Christ is what has brought us together. And we're so blessed to have Christ, to have the shed blood of Christ, to know that we are covered. But again, are we really that thankful whenever we just keep doing what we know we're not? So let me get to the main part of my sermon. 
What I'm talking about are consistencies with every movie and TV show you watch. Think about this. Next time you're watching Netflix, next time you're watching whatever show, some of these are common in each and every thing we watch. Let's start out with this. The world says, let's just live with someone before marriage. It's no big deal. Why buy the cow when the milk is free? Nothing wrong with a one-night stand. What does the Bible say? God's word says this in Hebrews 13, 4. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Let that sink in. Give honor to marriage. Why don't people get married anymore? Because it's no big deal, right? It's what the world says. That's what the world wants us to think. It's no big deal. I want to say this, and yes, we have some young people in there. PG-13, I promise. Casual sex is an immoral sin. How many times do you watch TV and it's a game for some people on TV? It's a game to how many notches we can put in our belt. It's no big deal. The world says, you know what, it's okay to get buzzed. It's okay to smoke a little doobie and not worry about anything. Man, let's get hammered tonight. It's going to be a blast. What does God's word say? God's word in Ephesians 5, 18 says, don't be drunk. Stop. What does it mean drunk? Now here, let me clarify. To the extent of losing control of one's faculties or behavior. Let me repeat that. To the extent of losing control of one's faculties or behavior. Let's continue on with the verse. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Go back to our temple example. Whatever we put in our mouth, whatever we put in our bodies, that's the temple of God. Now, I know this is a gray area for a lot of people, and I get that, all right? But I want to say this. If you feel convicted, if one of these gray areas convicts you to what you ought not to do, you ought not to do it, okay? doesn't matter if it's legal or not. You should do what God has laid on your heart to do. Now, I want to be careful here. I'm not one. I got to be very careful. Let me say this. Let me give you something biblical. Paul told Timothy, drink a little wine. It'll help with your stomach. See, he's having stomach issues. A casual drink is not going to send you to hell. Okay? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want someone to take what I'm saying and run with it and say all these things. What I'm saying is anything that you ingest into your body that causes you not to be able to think properly is a sin. The world says, husbands, treat treat your wife any way you want. You don't need to respect her. You're the man of the house. Then the women get together. Girl, you got all the power. What you talking about? Or they might say something like this. We know who rules that house. What does the Bible say in Ephesians 5, 21? And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It means you're taking your baggage, she's taking hers, and you're fitting it in one suitcase. And you are trying to make it work as best as you can. It means, and we're going to get to this in just a sec, that you love her as Christ loves the church. Do you love Christ? What does it say right there? Out of reverence for Christ. If you claim you love Jesus and you treat your wife a way that you shouldn't, you need to check how you love the Lord. Wives, if you say you love Jesus and you treat your husband a certain way, you need to check how your relationship is with the Lord. Let me say this. Do you realize how we treat our husbands? Rewind. How we treat our wives is how our daughters are going to be used to things whenever they get married. They typically look for a guy just like you. And wives, the way you treat your husbands are typically the way our daughters treat their husbands. You need to think about that for just a second. We are an examples. We are living examples to our children. Let me give you another verse. Ephesians 5, 31 and 33. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two are united into one. 
This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, I want to, again, I want to be careful here. Man or woman, husband or wife. God does not expect us to enter into a relationship where we are abused physically, emotionally, or mentally. That is not what God is saying to us. And I'm going to say this goes both ways. If you're treating your significant other like anything other than a prince or a princess, you're doing it wrong. Do you truly love them the way God loves us? Do you truly love them the way Christ loves the church? It's something we all need to think about. No one is a property or another. There is not one above another. When two become one, what does that mean? It means you are on the same level. It is not a man's world. It's not a wife's world. You are two becoming one. Now, again, there is hierarchy, and we can get into that later. But that only comes into effect when they deserve it. Now, let me expand on that. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean this. The Bible tells us over and over again that an unbelieving husband or wife one should not leave the other just because of that as long as it interferes with them going to church, right? Because we are examples to them. And you can bring them to Christ through that example. Think about that for just a minute. So again, we've got to be careful here. Now, here we go. Are you ready? You kids, how many young people we got? We got a few. All right. All right. Here we go. All right. I like that. All right. I remember hearing some of these things growing up. Are you ready? I don't listen to anything my parents say. I don't have to do that. My parents are so dumb. Little Johnny's so cool. Man, he doesn't do anything his mom and dad ask him to do. Anybody here remember having those conversations with some of your friends? We all have, right? What does God's word say? God's word in Colossians 3.20 says, Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Let me say this. As a father, and I always will be a father, my kids have left the house. I'll never stop being a father, but when they were under my care and Christy's care, I never once told them not to do something that was going to hurt them. I never told them not to do something that was just for, I didn't say that right. I never once told them not to do something just to be mean. Let me say that, okay? That came out better. I never once withheld anything good from them. Anytime I told them not to do something, I wanted it to be for their benefit. You see how that means? How that means? <laughs> I talk about putting your finger in the socket all the time. Let me say it this way. My parents told me not to do it. You know what I did? I stuck a fork in a socket one time. By the grace of God, I did not get juiced, and I'm still here today. My parents were dumb. I didn't know what they were talking about. Right here, Colossians 3.20, children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Again, let me give a little disclaimer here. Sometimes our parents aren't always the greatest, right? Sometimes our parents aren't always the greatest example. And I think in those situations, and I'm not talking younger, I'm talking as we grow and mature, sometimes we need to love our parents from afar as well. We can be respectful and distance ourselves again at the same time and obey what God has to say. Now let me say this. The world says, don't discipline your children. Send them to the corner. Just take away Johnny's little tablet, phone, or video game system. Huh. Just yell at Johnny. He'll get it eventually. You know what the Bible says about that? Now, I, I want to I I really get in here for just a second. Growing up, do you realize my bedroom and my house was probably nicer than a third world country's mansion in a lot of ways? I had air conditioning. I had carpet. I had a TV. I had a video game system. My mom and dad sent me to my room. You bet. That's like a vacation, right? Now, I didn't have a $1,000 phone like a lot of kids have today, okay? But we didn't have phones back then. If we did, I probably would have had one. We live in a world that says, you know what, you just you keep yelling at your kids until they eventually get it. But you know God's word has something amazing to say about it. And I'm going to show you. Everything I'm telling you here is biblical. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24 says this. Are you ready? It's harsh. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. However, those that love their children care enough to discipline them. Let me repeat that. Those that spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Let me say this. Christy gave me a talking to in between. I've got to be very careful here. 
Let me say it this way. I'm a child of the 80s. My butt got beat a few times, and I survived, okay? I survived the spankings, all right? Now, obviously, you know where I stand on that, and I'll just leave that there. But I'm going to say this, too, and I mean this. When my son and my daughter was at home, I had to deal with them differently. What worked the way I disciplined her did not work with him. But here's what I'm getting at. When the yelling and the taking away of their $1,000 phone and cell phone and uh, video game system didn't work, might try a little tap on the hiney. I'm just going to be straight up, okay? And, and, and you know what? It's not going to kill him. You know why? I've got verse to prove it. Let me show you. Here we go. You ready? Here we go. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. I told you it's all biblical today. It's not me. Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment will not kill them. Actually, physical discipline may well save them from death. Whoa, did you hear that? Let me repeat it. Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Physical discipline may very well save them from death. You ever think about that? And I get it. As a father, I was not the disciplinary. I seem like, boy, I'm just all about spanking and stuff, and I'm not. It's hard. It hurt. You know, you ever, you ever hear that? It, this hurts me way more than it hurts you. Anybody get told that? I was like, yeah, right, Dad. I, my butt's not feeling that, right? And, and, and it does. As a father or a mother, it does when you discipline your kids. It hurts so bad. Because we love our children so much, but you know what? Sometimes we need that extra boost of discipline. Again, I'm going to land the plane here. These are examples that I watch throughout movies, throughout TV shows that were current. They ran in each one, every single one. What I'm here, I want you to have the best 2020 you can ever have. I want you to have every blessing that God has for you. And I want to tell you something. It starts with me, and it starts with you. It starts with us. It starts with us examining ourselves, as the great psalmist said, said, search me, O Lord, and show me. Point out anything in me that may offend you. Bring it to light so that I will not do those things. And if you don't pray that prayer once in a while, if you don't ask God to search you, you're living a false relationship. You have a false security with God. I'm going to say it again. If you think everything's going great and you pray that prayer, I've done it. God will show and point out things to you that you thought, wow, I didn't even think about it that way. We're not all perfect. We're not all greatest thing ever, although sometimes I think we feel like that. We're kind of like magnets. Let me give you one more illustration. You ever taken a magnet and drug it across something that's metal, metallic? What does it do? As it goes along, it picks up those other objects, doesn't it? And next thing you know, you've ran this magnet across and just more and more things have stuck to it. If we're not careful as Christians and we don't point out our own sin in our own lives, I'm not here to point fingers. I'm here to point them back at me. If we don't do that in our lives, by the time we end up teenagers, by the time we end up as young adults, we will have drugged so much stuff with us we don't know what happened. And then we cry out to God, where did you go? And God said, I didn't go anywhere. I've always been right here. You're the one that are doing all these worldly things. You're in this gray area of your life. And, and why is it? It's because we don't stop and we don't ask God to search us. Lastly, we need to live in God. In verses 5 and 6, we know that we live in God by keeping his commandments. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. This is how we know we are living in Him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. When we are in a growing relationship with God, we are going to love and obey His commandments. God is not going to tell us not to do anything that's going to hurt us. It may feel like you're missing out, right? Your, your friends are doing something really cool and you want to be a part of it. Anybody ever do that? Man, I just want to do it. And your mom says, don't do that. Don't do that. I lived my whole life. I had parents that cared enough about me that told me not to do those things. And I didn't like it, and I'd stomp my feet. But you know what? I look back now, and I'm so thankful for them. Think about this the same way. This is God saying, Johnny, don't do it. I know what's right for you. I know what's best. Just don't do it. Trust me. I'm your heavenly father. Trust me. Think about it this way. Sin either corrupts or destructs. It either corrupts or destructs. Nothing good can come from sin. Just like those calories I ate this last week, 
They did me no good whatsoever. Now, they tasted good, let me tell you. But they did me no earthly good whatsoever. John was very point blank in his message. He was very point blank in what he had to say to us. And for many of you, you may be upset right now. For many of you, maybe I roused something in you. It's not me, it's God. But I want to say this, before you leave here today and you get in your car and you say, boy, that was a horrible sermon, you know, I didn't learn anything there. I want to say this, search your heart. Search yourself. Are you living the life that God wants you to live? Are you as close to God as you want to be? Let me give you two verses, and I don't have them. They just kind of came to me as I was coming down here from, uh, from home. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to read verses 7 and 10. 1 John 3, 7 and 10, I'll go quickly. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning since the beginning, or excuse me, but when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Glory to God. Those who have been into, born excuse me, into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So now we tell, now excuse me, we can tell who are children of God. And who are children of the devil? Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love others, other believers, does not belong to God. Pretty harsh words. One more. 1 John 5, 18 through 21. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning. For God's Son holds them securely and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under control of the evil one. However, we know that the Son of God has come, and He has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God, and He is eternal life. Whether or not we choose to sin, whether or not you're here today and you're caught up in an unrepented, continual lifestyle is up to you. It's not even a lifestyle. It's things we do, things the world says, great, and go for it. And we'll have the praise team come forward. These sermons aren't easy. I want to tell you, they're not easy to hear, and they're not easy to prepare. But again, as pastors are saying, I want to give you a, a 2020 vision sermon. I want to have all these. I want you to have blessings. I can preach that all day long. You can turn on TV, and you can get it all day long. But when you got someone that's going to tell you about sin, not their opinion, but God's opinion on sin, that's a difference. It's a difference you don't hear every day. And it's one that in 2020, I'm going to be better about. I promise you that. Now, I want to say this. I've been harsh. I've been distant in a lot of ways, and I'm turning this off. There is grace and there is mercy. And the shed blood of Jesus is big enough to cover everything we have. Don't ever lose sight of that. Amen. Don't ever lose sight of what Christ did for you. But if you can live a life that we just read about, just a few examples, we could go on and on and on. But if you can live like that and not feel anything bad, you need to check your heart. You need to check your relationship. You need to check the closeness that you have with God. If anybody would stand, I'd just love for you to reflect. We have our altars are open. If you'd like to use them for any reason, please feel free to do so. But God loves you.